Welcome back to Live with the Mod, the Poet, powered by Revolution of One, where we have the greatest guests and most powerful conversations. And today is no different. Today, we have a very special guest on the program with us today who graced us with a little bit of her presence. Uh, we have a clinical psychologist, an author, and a college professor, Dr. Rita Walker, on the program with us today. How are you doing today, family? I'm good. I am I am blessed and, and feeling like I'm where I'm supposed to be right now. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, like I was saying um, before the cameras came on, it's a whole lot that I wanted to talk to you about. And I know um, something that actually surprised me was uh, I saw you talking on The Breakfast Club, actually, about how you focused on um, mental health from a, a suicide perspective in college, how you started studying black suicides. And um, that's such a deep topic in itself. Um, I wanted to ask you, what made you um, focus on that specifically? Um because I know there's such a wide range um, of psychology therapy. You know, you got childhood therapy, you got all these different types of therapy. What made you want to focus on that specifically? Well, you know, it started for me with just a, a deep interest in the psychology of Black people. Like that mm -hmm. has always been a, for lack of a better word, curiosity for me. And especially where our reality differs from mm -hmm. that of other people. And as an undergraduate student at University of Georgia, you know, as a psychology major, uh, you know, the way they talked about things like depression, I was like, yeah, I don't think we really see that in Black people. Like there was just something about what I was studying that just didn't resonate. And so, you know, I got all A's because that's what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I recognized that there was something different. And when I went to grad school, I thought I was going to be able to, you know, look at depression in Black people and I couldn't find anyone or at least the way the doctoral programs are set up, there wasn't anyone that I could work with who was, who was going to be able to do that work with me. But there was someone who was looking at suicide. And like everybody else, I thought, well, Black people don't kill themselves, but okay, well, maybe we can look at this because I, I understood depression and suicide to be related. Well, like a good grad student, you know, I went and looked at the literature. Like that's what you always have to do is to look and see what's published. And what I found at the time, and this was the the mid late nineties, was that the suicide rate was going up and no one was talking about it. So then that became my curiosity: like, what in the world is going on? Why is no one talking about it? And what can be done? Mm. And that was a focus on younger children, because I think you talked about the focus on younger children that you. That it yes. Was, okay. Yes, because you've been keeping up. <laughs> um, at that time, it was it was young adults. So mm -hmm. it was definitely young adults at that time. More recently, what prompted me to write The Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health was, in fact, the rates going up for five to 11 year old black children. And so we have to separate not just by, you know, looking at black and African-American people, but also looking within age groups, because, yeah, you know what someone who's 65 years old may is going through is going to be different than what someone who is six is going through. So we have to look at different age groups also, as you know. Mm. And I wanted to ask, what do you feel like? What are the qualifications, if there are qualifications, to make depression real? Because I heard you talk about it on The Breakfast Club where y'all was having like a, a conversation, a discourse around children, seeing other children and like, OK, well, they say they're depressed, so I must be depressed. So is depression a feeling? Is it something that you can self-diagnose or is it something that is like, OK, I'm seeing they're doing this, this and this. That's real depression versus they're emulating somebody else because I felt like it was just such a fluid concept. I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to get a grasp on what's real and what's not per se. You know, it's I I know it can be really confusing for people in the general public that's like, what even is this? Like, what yeah. are we even really talking about? And what I like to do is to just distill mental health challenges is a big old thing to recognizing that there's an issue. If the person is having trouble consistently with like relationships, you know, they're not able to function at work. They're not able to function at home. Like if there is something going on that you don't know about, you know, like you don't have some serious injury or maybe you, you know, we're in a car accident. And so people have, you know, physical brain trauma. Mm -hmm. If there is something going on that you do feel just kind of weighed down or maybe just not like yourself and you cannot function, that is a threshold for figuring out, have I met a clinical level? of say depression or anxiety, because yeah, people say all the time, well, I'm depressed. You know, I just, I, I just feel depressed. Um, and, and to be sure everyone has a bad day. Like we, mm -hmm. we all have bad days. I have bad days, 
But what happens is when those bad days get to be prolonged for weeks or months, and there are people who are depressed for years. And when I talk about depression, it's a constellation of things. So it's like, I'm feeling down and low and sad, or I'm feeling empty on the inside, or I feel just really agitated because there are some people whose depression is masked because they just seem angry Mm. all the time. But it's kind of that combined with maybe difficulties, eating, sleeping, like not eating enough, not sleeping enough, um, feelings of being worthless, having difficulties with concentration, actually, and memory. Um, So there's a constellation of things that come together. And you asked an important question that is also, well, do people need to diagnose themselves? I don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's one of the reasons that it's helpful to see a licensed professional, because that's where we start is with let's talk about what's going on for you, whether or not this is characteristic of you um, and whether or not you have a, you know, kind of a um, shortcoming of of the good stuff, you know, because we also want to balance out, you know, positive things happening in our lives, you know, and so the, the professional can have a conversation to diagnose for the individual. So is there a healthy amount of stress when it comes to like daily production in life? Like with, cause I know you're a college professor. So, and I, I recently graduated, I graduated college last year. And I feel like that was, that's a very stressful environment, but I also feel like a part of that is like natural for production. You know, when, when they say when you're nervous or when you're stressed, it sometimes it causes you to produce, but is there a way to like curve that or like, have a holistic approach to being like a college professor or, or like a boss who has an employee and you're trying to like minimize their stress levels for like the optimal, um, or, uh, like for their mental health, or is it just a part of like these environments that we exist in? You know, it's another good question. It actually goes back to what I was saying about mental illness or clinical levels of psychological problems. If the stress is is helping you like it's pushing you you know you feel motivated and compelled like okay i got to get this thing done you you know you're driven to get it done okay great but when the stress gets to a point where it's overwhelming um where people start to feel burned out as an example like i can't take this no more then you know the stress has gotten to be too much so can the person function with the stress yes good if not okay they may need to dial it back uh take a time out or figure out something else. Mm, is that something that you're mindful about with your students? Like just man, or or is, is it a part of the product? I mean, cause I know in the health field, you have to be able to operate underneath like high levels of stress or, you know, a strenuous schedule. So is that something that is just like a part of the training or is it something that is like, okay, well, maybe I can work with this person. It's funny you, you would mention that because uh, the research has been showing that including doctoral students in, in clinical psychology and counseling psychology, uh, there has been more psychological distress reported. You know, folks are struggling more. I think some of that started with the pandemic, but it, it actually predated the pandemic, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we are seeing a lot more emotional health challenges, even among people who are working on PhDs to help other people. Um, and so I think that honestly, Uh, Some of us may be better at recognizing and and helping students to redirect. Um, We're all human, though. So I think some of us are maybe less good and successful at that. And then because once you get to a point of being psychologically overwhelmed, it's hard to see it. Um, I think that the students themselves may not always recognize when they're having a difficult time. And that's why it's important to have a good peer network. And we will say that to anyone, like you can't really do this thing without support. But if you think about any big thing in life, it's hard to do without support. Mm. And that, it just because the reason I ask is just I, I hear a lot of people saying that, you know, the new generation is softer or they have a a deeper sensibility for like mental health or different things like that. But I just feel like it's the awareness that makes people just more aware of what is good, what isn't. It's like sometimes if you're feeling a pain, if you don't know, like this is like unbearable because everybody's saying like, this is the level of pain that I deal with. So now this becomes your normal. But once you know what is normal and what is not, you start to have like a different sensibility for it, you know? So I just feel like, um, well, would you say that the 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 rise in mental health awareness or mental health, I don't want to say issues, but just 
people being able to acknowledge it is coming from more mental health happening or was it the same for generations? There's always been this level of mental health, but now we're just acknowledging it. It's, it's, it's interesting. And to be honest, I haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it though. It is worth doing. So I do think a big part of it is people having the language. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, you know, on that, that show that you, you mentioned, um, you know, Charlemagne also known as Leonard McElvey mentioned that his daughter came to him and said she was overwhelmed because she had mm-hmm. language. And so even me writing the book was to give people language for what they're experiencing. Because I think there are a lot of people who have felt anxious and mm-hmm. felt depressed, but didn't know how to label it. And mm-hmm. so if you can't label it, then you think, oh, it's just in my head. Oh, you know, whatever. Just keep pushing no matter what. But that can have consequences. At the same time, and I think this is the part that that I would want to spend a little bit more time thinking about is, you know, how we have, in fact, started to um, adapt differently to the society that we live in. Mm. So as an example, you know, we got smartphones. Everything is at our fingertips. Uh, You know, for some people, microwaves always existed. You know, you didn't have to wait a long time for your food to be warmed up. You know, like there are so many more conveniences that we have that folks didn't have to struggle naturally, mm. don't have to struggle naturally as much now as was the case, you know, a couple of generations ago. And so I do think that it's a, it's a combination of things that we have more language and people have had to go through less. At the same time, some of the stuff that people went through that was a lot of violence and trauma, uh, we don't need that in our lives either. So I think for every individual, you know, it's important. And this is where, you know, parenting comes into place. And I'm not a parenting expert, I'm a a psychologist who happens to be a parent, um, you know, that we have to be mindful, you know, of who our children are, where where their strengths and weaknesses are, um, and how we can help to both nurture them and also discipline them so that they can be better functioning adults and better, you know, members of our society. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because it's like, I noticed it's, it's almost two sides of the spectrum. You have a side of youth that that is like extra sensitive. And then you have another side of youth that is desensitized by all the stuff that they're seeing online or all the stuff that they're seeing in the world. So it, it kind of is interesting to me because I feel like it's not just one thing. It's not just a part of them that's like super sensitive because it's another part that's like not really sensitive at all based on the different things that they're seeing. So I, I just feel like a, social media kind of just changed the landscape for a lot of things. You know, and uh, I don't know when the the well, they probably do have case studies out. Are there um, studies out right now about the effects on uh, of of social me- uh, social media and, and mental health and depression? Oh yes, they do, and it's bad because um, of the comparison. And so, you know, that's why we have to be mindful of the amount of exposure mm-hmm. that happens when it comes to social media, because part of the challenge for for young minds is not having. Uh, the brain development, because the brain doesn't fully develop, you know, for girls until about age 18, 19, for boys, early 20s. Mm -hmm. And so you're consuming information as a 12, 13, 15, 17 year old, and you don't receive the information in ways that we're psychologically prepared to receive information. Um, And so, yeah, there's so many things about social media that are that are great. You know, we we got to see we all came together with the Montgomery brawl, right? You know, so we got some some jokes yeah. off and we were able to come together. Uh, but then there are other parts of it that are that are damaging to, to be sure. Yeah, I've definitely had to monitor my usage as well, but it's it's, it's just so much even when it comes to that, because it's like, a, it's, it's definitely a tool for sure, um, but it does get to a certain point where it starts to use you. And uh, I, I just, I love when I hear like very successful affluent people talk about their battles with it. I was watching an interview today on a diary of a CEO and and I can't remember this lady's name, but she was very, very good speaker, very good businesswoman. And she was just talking about how sometimes she just loses her focus with social media, just loses it. And she's very successful. She's just like, it's something that we all battle. And I just love hearing people talk about that because sometimes it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's just something that they deal with. It's like, we all deal with it. You know, we all deal with it. Um, I also did want to talk about something I saw on your site um, about the, one of the mission statements. It says, my goal is to help you reclaim your mind by reclaiming your culture and your power. Um, I wanted to ask, what is the importance of culture on 
uh, therapy, psychology, just mental health? What is the importance of our culture in that? You know, we talk about culture in different ways. And so it means different things for different people. But essentially, culture is what is passed down from generation to generation uh, that helps us to understand the world around us and to make sense of the world around us. And that's why people from different cultures will see the exact same thing and have totally different perspectives. And so it also includes, yeah, things like what we eat and, you know, what, how we dress and things of that nature. But the important part of culture for me is just is worldview. It is, you know, how do you make sense of an event? And so as an example, you know, we could say um, or, or now we can say it's, it's, it's helpful to be able to say, yes, black people have been through a lot in the U.S. and around the world. And the key word here is been through. You know, I heard I was reading earlier and I'm sure you've heard folks say, you know, they 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 buried us, but they didn't know we were seeds. Um, and so there is something in our Constitution, in who we are, that says we can overcome no matter what. And when you have that kind of mindset, you know, that when struggle happens, you know, you don't necessarily you're less likely or one is less likely to crumble. But because they're able to say, you know, my ancestors, my ancestors, my granny and my auntie Nim that I know went through worse and they were able to overcome. So let me figure out how I can navigate whatever hardship or whatever uncertainty. But when we lose track of the culture for whatever reason, you know, then those individuals and my research has shown this, like people who don't have a positive sense of what it means to be black are mm -hmm. more likely to have you know, symptoms of depression or more likely to think about suicide because they just don't have that, that connection. Um, and so that connection to the culture where people are able to make sense of the world around them, make sense of their own lives, you know, those folks are they they simply thrive and not even just psychologically, but also in schools. Like there's research on on youth who, when they have a positive sense and they know what it means to be black, they are able to thrive more so academically. Mm. And uh, I, I think that individualistic approach is is powerful, understanding the larger collective, the history, and you know, the, the rich culture that we come from. But also understanding that, you know, everybody has different sensibilities. Um, just talking about family, just raising with family, because sometimes we're not sensitive to certain children, certain members of the family because we want them to show up like this. But we can't talk to everybody the same or deal with everybody the same. And I definitely had to learn that, you know, just with with my family. It's like, you know, I, I might want my little brother to be like me or to handle something like me. And it's like, man, he has a different level of sensibility about things, which is interesting and unique. Um, but I also wanted to ask you about on that culture piece. I think you guys might have discussed this on the Breakfast Club, if I'm not mistaken. I heard Charlemagne ask the question. I'm not sure if it was to you or it might have been to Dr. Alfie, I believe. But um, he was asking about an interview that Offset had did on the Breakfast Club and talking about how he couldn't relate to his therapist from a, a, a history perspective and a cultural perspective. Like you, you haven't been through what I've been through. Do you feel like it's important for a therapist to have been through somewhat similar to, or had similar experiences to their client? Or maybe that adds a little bit of clarity because it's like maybe this is normal for you. And I'm letting you know this is not normal. You know, I, I, just because I didn't experience this doesn't like doesn't stop me from allowing me to see this is not normal. Or maybe some people want somebody might have a similar experience so they could be like, I can justify the way you went about things. You know, I, I just wanted to kind of unpack that because that was like a, a heavy, a heavy topic that I see a lot of people talk about. I I, I bet it I bet it was a heavy topic, and uh, I can tell you that the research shows that the single most important factor in whether or not someone is able to benefit from therapy is their connection to the therapist. Mm. So that therapist, for a black person. Oftentimes we look for a black therapist yep. because we know that we're more likely to connect with a black person than we are with a white person. Now, of course, there are black people who will connect better with white people and that's for them. But for black people who are looking for a black therapist, yeah, it's sort of I don't have to explain all these things to you because you already know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to worry about you saying things to me that are going to be offensive because I deal with enough of that outside at work everywhere else. And so the presumption is that, yes, it helps to have a Black therapist who's going to be able to connect with that individual. At the same time, there are white therapists who are, in fact, able to connect. Mm. They exist. 
uh, one of my responsibilities in addition to research uh, at the university is to train doctoral students who are working on their PhDs. Mm -hmm. And so there is no way a trainee is going to get away from me without having the level of cultural humility that it takes to be able to sit in a room and help a Black person with psychological problems. And so it depends on what that person's training is. But you probably know this. uh, There are relatively few of us who are clinical psychology PhDs in the university setting who are training the next generation. So there are some folks out there who aren't going to be comfortable in front of a a Black client. And that's unfortunate, uh, but it's real. It's Mm -hmm. absolutely real. I wanted to ask as well, when it comes to like day-to-day scheduling, um, I know a lot of people talk about um, having like a good pattern, having a good schedule, a good routine. But um, what is the importance of like spontaneity, just like, you know, having a mix up in your schedule for like good mental health? Because I know like sometimes I have a good schedule, I have things that I'm sticking to and then it starts to like weigh on me, you know, even sticking to my schedule, even though it's been healthy for me for a long time, it starts to get to a point where it becomes unhealthy. So uh, if you could just talk about the importance of like um, kind of just finding di- or or evolving your schedule or adjusting your schedule through time. I got to tell you, I hear a couple of different questions in there. So I'm going to, I'm going to try one of them. Okay. Um, so one of the things about having a, a schedule is the structure of it all, especially for someone who has a lot of different responsibilities and a lot of different spaces. So they, maybe they work outside the home, they have young children, they have a spouse, they're cooking. Maybe they even have a grandparent or somebody else at home. Uh, They're active in a lot of different organizations. Like they're doing a lot. When there are things that are more automated because they have a structure, then they don't have to think about those things as much. And it takes up less of their, um, their cognitive capacity. So to the degree that someone can automate different parts of their lives, then yeah, that kind of frees them up to be more creative, you know, and also honestly to be more present where they need to be present rather than thinking about, oh shoot, did I miss something? Oh man, I'm not even where I'm supposed to be. You know, like those oopsies that happen. So I will say that about about structure. Uh, And hopefully that answers the question about that part. But then there's also the idea of spontaneity, um, which, well, tell me, can you say more about that question again so I can? It's, it's, It's really just about being able to not be so married to a schedule or constricted to a schedule where you can, adjust with your day. You know, sometimes I I see different things come up in, in my life. Like I said, just today with my audio setup, but it's like, um, my audio setup is, is that like a little bit, it's, it's an hour away in Detroit. I don't live in Detroit. I live in Flint. So I would have to drive there to get set up at my studio. And I'm just like, nah, I'm just going to set up at my house. So instead of just doing it at the studio. So it's just a level of, of just, not feeling bad about yourself for not being able to do X, Y, and Z. You know, I know a lot of people feel so bad when they couldn't do this or they couldn't show up to this event or they couldn't, it's like, just adjust with your schedule, you know, and just kind of let it flow. And I'm definitely one of those type of people. I'm a perfectionist. So if something doesn't go right, then it can make me feel, you know, like bad, you know? You know, those perfectionists, you already know. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a time if things don't go exactly the way you set it up at the same time, it gives you, you know, more mental space. If you're able to just go with the flow because we can't control everything, right? Like that's just kind of life. You can't control everything. And so when something happens as an example that you have no control over, you need to be able to just kind of stand on your own two feet and say, okay, this didn't go as planned. What do I do with what I have here in the moment? Because I'm convinced, you know, sometimes the universe will throw monkey wrenches just so just so you have to be more in the moment and use what you have in a way that's even better than what you had planned. I am absolutely convinced of that. Now, don't get me wrong. When things don't go my way, I'm like, well, what now? But we need to be able to have that what now moment and then regroup. And come back to ourselves and say, okay, what do I do with what I have so that I can maximize this particular moment? Because, yeah, when we get kind of stuck in our own cognitive rigidity, 
um, then that can be, you know, we can start to feel frustrated and our frustration start, maybe you take it out on somebody else. And it just, it's just not as helpful as having the cognitive flexibility to just be in the moment with whatever you have. Do you find a, a, a similar amount of depression or, or, or just anxiety when it comes to like high performers or people who are affluent, successful, whatever the case may be, and people who might not be in the financial position that they would like to be in? Do you see it as the same? Because And the reason I ask, well, I'll just ask that question because, you know, I can go and uh, expand on the question. But um, the reason I was saying it was, uh, it's just, I feel like a lot of people who might not be successful, quote unquote, they find inspiration behind chasing money. But people who might have the money, it's like, where do I go now? You know, I kind of reached the end of the road and, you know, it wasn't what I suspected. That's why I asked the question. You know, I think that there are expectations that once you get to a certain place in life, that things are just supposed to be easier or supposed to go a certain way. Um, and one of the things that we have seen is um, a relatively, can I say that? I think a, 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 a non-invulnerability. So we still see vulnerability to suicide for people who other folks are like, oh my goodness, well, they were so successful. They have so much going for them. Like, why in the world are they thinking about ending their lives? Why did they take their life? First of all, we never know what someone is going through, um, you know, first and foremost. And then the other thing is that when those individuals get to a certain place and they have people judging them, they sometimes can internalize that. Well, yeah, I, I shouldn't feel depressed or I shouldn't feel anxious. And I add that, by the way, because in Black people, the research is, is suggesting that anxiety is as much as a predictor of suicide as is depression. So I needed to mm -hmm. add that in there. But for folks who feel like they should be a certain place, which is why I want to eradicate the word should from our whole vocabulary, to be honest, um, you know, that those folks can struggle because they feel more isolated because they're like, well, I haven't accomplished what I was supposed to accomplish. I like that whole should concept. But I remember you and uh. Charlemagne had like a little back and forth about that. It was funny. He raised the thing about yeah. He raised the thing about drugs. Like, oh well, what about this scenario? And then you was like, you would ask that. Um, but yeah, that was that that was uh, good stuff. But um, yeah, the, the the reason I'm asking is is because I I feel like um, I feel like it's the expectations piece. You know, when you get to that being a high performer and and you have all those expectations or expectations out of life and people having expectations of you. Um, and, and I talk to my friends often about that, you know, who might not have grown up in two parent households or might not have grown up in households with certain expectations. And I felt like there is a pros and cons to that, you know, having like a an intense amount of expectations from you growing up and going to college. And would you say that expectations are healthy for children or is there a de uh, another way to go about things or is like, or do, maybe it, does it get to a certain age where expectations are no longer necessary? Because as children, I feel like expectations are good. But do you feel like it gets to a certain point where they can kind of like turn negative? Well, I do think it's important to have expectations. So, so because we need a place to aspire to. Mm -hmm. uh, we were all put on this planet to achieve something. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we can achieve much, you know, if we're sitting around on the sofa. Um, and so we have to have those expectations, you know, that starts with family members and friends and saying, you know, I expect you to be able to get up and take a shower and clean yourself. And eventually I expect you to be able to cook and and have some sense of responsibility. You know, otherwise we completely abdicate responsibility. And then these folks grow up to be adults who can't take care of themselves. Um, and so we have to have a certain level of, of expectation but sometimes those expe expectations do have to be, you know, modified based on that person's ability level. You know, and, and I think you were talking about this earlier, just even based on somebody's temperament, because you may have, you know, two different people growing up in the same household and seemingly having the same genes, but they still have very different personalities and, and different goals that they need to be able to achieve. And so if somebody is, is forcing something upon them that doesn't fit them, then that could have, you know, that could have negative consequences. For me, if you're asking about um, pursuing the, the degree, when I was growing up, my mom gave me two options. Um, I was, I grew up as the oldest child. I, I need to actually ask my sister if she got these two options. You know, I could be a lawyer or a doctor. 
Um, neither one of my parents went to college, but I, that was the expectation. And so I just assumed that like, okay, well, I guess I'll pick law school because I'm not really here for the math. Um, and so I'll, I'll do law school. I like to talk. And then what happened was that I got to shadow an attorney or few attorneys as an undergraduate student. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's for me. That's, that just doesn't look like what I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so then I had to take a step back and say to my mom, and it wasn't a fun conversation. I, I got to tell you, you know, but I had to say, you know what? I don't want to go to law school. That's mm -hmm. not what I want to do. And so she was like, okay, well, what will you do? And then I had to figure it out. So there was an expectation that I would do mm -hmm. something. Um, I had, I wasn't going to do what she expected me to do, but I still was going to go forward. And I do think that there are some young people. I appreciate that mom. My mom was flexible. Um, but there's, and I did get the doctorate. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, well, okay, well, I guess I'll get this doctorate after all. It's not a medical doctor, but I'll get it. And I do think that there are some young people who feel pressure, you know, to do specific kinds of things because their families are, are rigid. And that um, I do know that that creates challenges because we see some of those youth um, at our clinic who are struggling because they have these family expectations and especially second generation people, um, ex second generation young adults, they're struggling with their family expectations and they're in therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that college, that college expectations is, is a deep one. It's definitely a deep one. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's a whole another whole another topic, you know. Um, but it, it definitely feels good for people to be flexible, with parents to be flexible with you, and just understanding that, you know, I just want you to be, you know, successful in your own right. I just want you to be great in your own right, and I just want you to be able to take care of yourself. But you know, just do great things, you know. Um, and that's definitely something that I've always just tried to uh, instill with a lot of. My mentees just, you know, because when I first started working with uh, the group of students that I work with, I started working with them in eighth grade, they're in 11th grade now. So some of them like, you know, I don't want to go to college. I don't I'm, I'm going to go to uh, job corps and I'm going to work in carpentry and do all. That. And I'm just, I had to learn to adjust with them because I was such a college heavy person. But I was just like, I got to just learn to be like, all right. So now, it's you know, because sometimes you, you got dreams like, man, you're going to go to Michigan State and you're going to go here and you're going to be wearing the emblem. You're going to be like, so you kind of have to reshape your dream for them. But you also got to understand it's their dream. It's not your dream because you have dreams, you know, you got dreams for them. So it's definitely good to adjust. I wanted to ask you. What was the um, purpose or what would you what, what was the purpose of focus behind you writing the uh, workbook that you just came out with, uh, the unapologetic workbook for black mental health? You know, the the fun thing about talking to people who read the first book, um, mm -hmm. The Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health, was the degree to which folks was like highlighting and underlining and writing notes in the margins and mm -hmm. using the skills and the strategies. And and me hearing about that was was so inspiring. And what I know as a clinical psychologist is that people need to see strategies broken way down. Like here's step one, step two, step three. Let's reflect on whether these steps work for you. And if they don't work for you, let's see how we can pivot. Like that's what happens in therapy or at least in evidence-based therapy. You know, we don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. We figure out what works for this person. And so a lot of the tools and skills that I introduced in the first book, I put them in the workbook and expanded on them and added lots of details and steps to say, OK, if you're here and this is your situation, let's see how we can break this down so that you can walk away with your mind more intact. So I think that probably um, the first book, The Unapologetic Guide, is a good combination of me being a researcher and a clinical psychologist because I, I know the research. And so I break down like some of the struggles, you know, that black folks are having in contemporary times. Mm. I introduce some of the skills and strategies, but I, you know, I couldn't do everything in one book. So the workbook um, just talks a little bit more about, okay, how do you use your spirituality as an example? How do you make it make sense for you? If you don't have, you know, a strong sense of spirituality, okay, that's fine. What can you do? And so I think it really works to kind of adapt the skills that I introduced in the first book in a way that more people can use it. And I saw you recently announced that y'all was a number one bestseller on Amazon. So I, I just wanted to give you your flowers for that uh, in, in the you. workbook category. Um, so where, where can we go to find that? Is it just strictly on Amazon or do you have it on the site as well? 
It is. There is a link on my site. So anyone who goes to drritawalker.com and you know Rita spelled R-H-E-E-D-A because I'm from Savannah, Georgia, and that's just how we do things sometimes. Um, but yeah, so I have links on there for both books, but it is also on Amazon. Yeah. And where can they go and find you on social media as well? I am on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as Dr. Rita Walker. Um, so I'm not I'm not hard to find. Hard to find and we'll have all her social medias pinned below and the website as well. We really appreciate you spending time with us, Dr. Rita Walker, and just, you know, just dropping some gems on us and just sharing space. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate this conversation. It's been fun. I appreciate it. It's Amad the Poet. We will see you in the next one. Peace.